Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to part 10. Let's just jump right into it with some anticonvulsant drugs. So first generation anticonvulsants, we'll start with valproate. Valproate is a GABA transaminase inhibitor. It's used for tonic-clonic seizures. It's also used for bipolar disorder and migraines. Remember the ones that have extra uses because they're very commonly tested. Migraines and bipolar for valproate. We'll see that other anti-seizure drugs are also used for migraines and bipolar, so watch out for those. All right, so the side effects for Valproate to look out for are alopecia, hair loss, teratogenicity, pancreatitis, increased LFTs, right? Those are the main ones to look out for. It's also a cytochrome P450 inhibitor. So we'll see a lot of these anti-seizure drugs are inducers. This one is an inhibitor, and that's important for watching out for people on birth control, watching out for people on anticoagulation, because those drugs will be affected by P450 inhibitors and inducers. So on the opposite side of the spectrum, we have an inducer, which is uh, carbamazepine, right? Carbamazepine is an inducer. It's also a first-line anti-seizure. Uh, it's used mainly for trigeminal neuralgia, focal seizures, so remember the secondary uses. Even though focal seizures might be the primary use, trigeminal neuralgia is the prime, is the is also important, right? So side effects here, really important to remember, SIADH, right? A granulocytosis, also important. Stevens-Johnson's, and that it's an inducer of P450. So make sure you differentiate also stevens johnson's from dress syndrome uh, these are both rashes stevens johnson's is obviously a lot worse and dress is associated more with eosinophilia and allergy type reaction so don't get confused on test if you see dress or uh, stevens johnson's because they're commonly a side effect for the same drug so make sure you differentiate the rashes there okay ethosuximide Ethosuximide is also first line for absence seizures. It acts on T-type calcium channels. That's You can think of T for thinking, for thought, for brain, okay? Those are the calcium channels in the brain. L-type are the ones, let's say, everywhere else in the smooth muscle and things like that. Side effects, SJS, a very common side effect for anti-seizure drugs, right? Stevens-Johnson syndrome, okay? Phenytoin is another great one. It has uh, uses in focal seizures and status epilepticus remember status epilepticus and if you had to guess what a, a seizure drug is used for and you threw focal seizure out there i think you'd be right about half the time all right so it works on uh, sodium channels it also has zero order elimination that's one of the key facts they like to throw out there because phenytoin and alcohol and some other drugs uh, are thrown into a category of zero order elimination and they like to test the physiology of that what are the side effects? So unlike valproate, which makes you go bald, uh, phenytoin makes you grow hair, so hirsutism, gingival hyperplasia, um, things like Stevens-Johnson's, again, dress syndrome. It is also a P450 inducer, right? Most of these are inducers. There are very few. Valproate is the inhibitor, uh, and it can cause something called fetal hydantoin syndrome, where you have microcephaly and a bunch of other problems, nail changes, nail hypoplasia, mental retardation in the child. So watch out for fetal hydantoin syndrome. Phenobarbital. Phenobarbital and benzodiazepines. So barbs and benzos, these are kind of uh, used for status epilepticus. I think benzos are more commonly used. Uh, if you've ever seen Ativan, I think Ativan is lorazepam. So you, that's one of the first lines for status epilepticus. It's also These are also used for things like eclampsia. Um, Remember, barbs are inducers of P450s, benzos are not. That's a key differentiator here, okay? Lamotrigine. Lamotrigine is first line for focal seizures. It's also used as a mood stabilizer. So uh, unlike valproate, which acts kind of through GABA, lamotrigine acts through sodium and is a mood stabilizer, just like valproate, all right? So remember, generalized seizures, it's second line. First line, it's for focal seizures and that it's a mood stabilizer. It also has SJS, Stevens Johnson's, as its side effect. So watch out for the rash with anti-seizure drugs. Next we have levetiracetam. This one has an unclear mechanism of action. It's good to know as an anti-seizure drug because it's first line for focal seizures and also can be used for generalized. Okay. Um, 
these, these second generation drugs like levetiracetam, uh, like lamotrigine, right? These can be used uh, also for other things like trigeminal neural, not, not trigeminal neural, that's carbamazepine. So these can be also used for things like um, herpetic neuralgia, sorry, herpetic neuralgia. So uh, pregabalin, gabapentin, these are herpetic neuralgia seizure drugs that have a dual use. And don't let the name confuse you. Uh, the GABA doesn't mean they work on GABA, they actually work on calcium and uh, they inhibit calcium channels that cause the release of glutamate. But um, postherpetic neuralgia is a very important use here, right? And peripheral neuropathy also. So uh, one of the GABA named drugs that does have an effect on GABA is vigabatrin. Don't get mixed up with the other two. Vigabatrin is separate. And not only is it used for f uh, focal seizures, it's also a monotherapy for infantile spasms. So if you remember West syndrome from pediatrics, where you have like uh, epileptic spasms um, in the first year of life because of some structural abnormalities in the brain. Uh, this vigabatrin is a first line drug for that, right? And it's associated with things like Down syndrome. You'll have a baby with, which has these recurrent uh, epileptic like spasms. Remember it's in, within the first year of life. Um, so vigabatrin is used there. One of the side effects that you gotta know is that uh, it often results in irreversible vision loss in up to 50% of patients. So not the best drug in the world, right? Topiramate is the last one we'll talk about. It's used for tonic-clonic seizures, also used for migraines. So remember migraines was valproate and topiramate. And then um, mood stabilizer was lamotrigine and valproate. So remember the ones that are used for migraines it, it blocks uh, it blocks sodium channels and induces GABA, so it has a dual action there. But the side effects are glaucoma, weight loss, and kidney stones. So watch out for glaucoma, weight loss, and kidney stones in topiramate patients. Okay, and some people topiramate might be helpful. Let's say you have migraines and you have um and you're overweight. Topiramate could help you out in that case, right? So sometimes they'll use the side effect as a benefit in the question stem. Next, we'll talk about, I think sarcoidosis is a topic that comes up on almost every single exam I've seen. So we'll, it'll do us some good to kind of just go over some sarcoidosis key facts. So this is a, one of those disorders that's multi-system. You have non-caseating granulomas and inflammation going on in multiple organ systems. Um, and you also have some kind of non-specific symptoms like fever, malaise, coughing, dyspnea. So the person will come in and they'll sound just generally sick. Remember that sarcoidosis can present just like a general cold, flu, a pneumonia, fever, malaise, cough, dyspnea, right? But they'll also have some other key features that'll tip you off, uh, such as anterior uveitis, erythema nodosum, arthralgias, right? Um, they also have that perihilar finding on x-ray. So before we jump ahead of ourselves, how does this disease kind of work? So really the pathophysiology has to do with T-cells. So it's a T-cell dysfunction, which is causes formation of non-caseating granulomas. That's granulomas with a non-necrotic center, right? So Th1 cells are um, inappropriately stimulated and these by things called epithelioid cells. So epithelioid cells in the lungs um, and multinucleated giant cells release interferon gamma, which stimulates CH1 cells, which kind of throws off this granulo granuloma formation and cycle of inflammation. These epithelioid cells are important though because they also increase production of ACE during the inflammation cycle, right? So you also can have increased ACE and if you have increased ACE, you can get things like hypertension, right? ACE inhibitors reduce hypertension. Increased it, levels of ACE can cause hypertension. So watch out for a blood pressure changes in these patients. You also have these granulo granuloma tissues increasing alpha-1 hydroxylase production, 
which in turn results in 125-hydroxy vitamin D being overproduced and hypercalcemia occurring. So uh, sarcoidosis really comes in two flavors, acute and chronic. In the acute phase, you're more likely to have the arthritis, the uveitis, and the erythema nodosum. And in the chronic phase, you can get lung findings such as interstitial fibrosis. Uh, the chronic sarcoid usually doesn't have early stage uh, findings or symptoms, but in the late stage, the, the breathing will be worse. The, peri, um, the peripheral lymph nodes can, can be very, very dispersed and very common. Um, usually uveitis is also present later on in the stage and you'll have skin findings. Uh, lupus perneo is a good one because it kind of looks like lupus but it spares the nasal labial folds. So watch out for lupus perneo in sarcoid cases. Your average patient is going to be an Afri African American female in her 20s or 30s with um, this kind of arthralgia, erythema nodosum, some lung findings. Your first diagnostic test, right? Your first diagnostic test is an x-ray and then you go from there. One of these syndromes is associated that is associated with sarcoid is called Lofgren syndrome. It's a very hyper acute sarcoid presentation. It's basically migratory polyarthritis, erythema nodosum, and bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy in the acute stage. So watch out for Lofgren syndrome as an answer with sarcoid cases because it's basically a hyper acute syndrome composed of those three symptoms arthritis, erythema nodosum, which is skin findings, and hilar lymphadenopathy, okay? So, as I said before, x-ray is your first, uh, first line. You'll see the hilar lymphadenopathy, the congestion in the hilar section of the x-ray. It's very obvious. And um, after that, you'll do a CT. You're, you'll do the CT to see the extension of the hilar lymphadenopathy. Um, It'll give you a better idea of how much inflammation has gone, if there's a good area to biopsy anything, if you need to, right? So other things you can do are lab tests. You'll see inflammatory, high inflammatory markers, ESR, CRP. Calcium will be high. ACE, ACE blood levels will be high, right? And also another thing that's kind of important is that uh, you will have a disruption in CD4, CD8 ratios. So CD4 T helper cells will actually be low because they're consumed during granuloma formation. So you'll have a, um, an unexplained low CD4 count without kind of HIV, right? A CD4, CD8 will both go down in HIV, but here just an isolated low CD4 count is a tip off. And um, if you do the bronchoscopy, which is the gold standard for finalizing the diagnosis, you'll find the non-caseated in granulomas. You'll have to do the CT scan to know, you know, where are we most likely to get a good sample here. And uh, if you do a bronchio, bronchiolar al bronchio alveolar lavage or a BAL, you can get the CD4 CD8 ratio, which we were talking about before but usually the bronchoscopy seals the deal. And if you have sarcoid, you obviously also can have a differential for TB, but remember that uh, those granulomas are, are caseating, and you can also put on your differential things like lymphomas, um, but you'll have very definite, one of the unique signs to sarcoid on in your findings, such as like the calcium, the ACE findings, the vitamin D. So they'll give you something that's unique to sarcoid and they'll help you differentiate from these other diseases. First line for this disease is steroids. Usually it self-resolves. So even if you just do supportive therapy, uh, the patient will be fine. But for very symptomatic patients or patients with extra pulmonary findings, um, you can throw in some steroids to help with these symptoms. Okay. So uh, sarcoid, it's a very commonly tested one. And I feel like we've we've gone through a good amount of the main points here. Um, another one that's kind of related, it's an inflammatory thing, it's amyloidosis. So uh, I remember Dr. Fisher in one of his 
um, educational video we used to say sarcoid amyloid hemochromatosis cancer and fibrosis I think it was for the um, uh, pericarditis uh, signs so so sarcoid and amyloid always kind of are grouped in my brain um, so amyloidosis comes in a few different flavors the main two ones are AA and AL uh, and that depends on where the amyloid is being produced so if we're talking about uh, a -A AL amyloid which is I think the more common one um, it's actually the most common one so AL amyloid is produced from light chains that are part of immunoglobulins so overproduction of immunoglobulins in something like my, multiple myeloma or Waldenstrom's um, any plasma cell problem can cause AL amyloidosis so once you diagnose this type of amyloidosis make sure you go back to the original etiology right make sure you go back to diagnosing the multiple myeloma the main findings here uh, tongue macroglossia this is one that's commonly missed it's not very obvious big tongue amyloid okay and it can cause obstructive sleep apnea so if you have someone who fits the picture of multiple myeloma right and who has obstructive sleep apnea you can think that the AA amyloid or the AL amyloid is causing their tongue microglossia and causing that obstruct OSA all right kidney nephrotic syndrome also a good one they love to test right the Ben Jones proteins you won't see on dipstick remember that you have to specifically test for them restrictive cardiomyopathy is something they love to test remember the restrictive pericarditis I was talking about earlier um, bleeding disorders amyloid loves to mess up the coagulation cascade and uh, things like carpal tunnel are also very common so carpal tunnel is something that they'll throw in there and you might think oh that's just nothing it's just a random carpal tunnel it, it can be associated with amyloid okay so uh, reactive amyloidosis is the other flavor that's the main one it's going to be a a amyloidosis this is associated with chronic inflammation so that's in people with IBD rheumatoid arthritis lupus uh, things like that vascular chronic vasculitis those are going to be your AA amyloid patients and this one presents similarly but also a little bit different you'll still have the carpal tunnel in this one you'll commonly get hepatomegaly and splenomegaly this type of amyloid loves to gather in the liver and spleen and clog it up and also the kidney nephrotic syndrome is shared so hepatomegaly and splenomegaly are more common for AA and the tongue finding right is more common for um, AL tongue and heart are going to be AL and AA is going to be liver spleen all right in most cases okay so if we just keep moving on and uh, I think we've talked about a good chunk of stuff with the amyloid um, let's talk about some hereditary amyloidosis because amyloidosis can cause all sorts of things uh, you know as soon as you see that apple green birefringence on Congo red stain the mind just kind of explodes into differentials so uh, there's family familial cardiomyopathy that's an amyloid associated disease you know you have a mutated uh, gene I think it's ATTR which is transthyretin so that causes uh, amyloid protein buildup in the heart and causes inflammation cardiomyopathy right this is an autosomal dominant disease um, this is associated with also polyneuropathy so cardiomyopathy and polyneuropathy are these familial amyloidosis problems I think they're a L amyloid associated and um, they also cause deposition of the amyloid into the either the myocardium of the heart or the peripheral nerves usually the autonomic nerves which can cause all sorts of dysfunction in people right and then there's a really nice test writer question called familial mediterranean fever this is a hereditary uh, autoimmune auto and auto inflammatory sorry auto inflammatory disease 
where you have a lot of self-limiting fever attacks, serositis. Um, really, really, this is named after Mediterraneans because it's mostly found in that region, right? It's autosomal recessive, and these patients have, in many cases, pleuritis, so it's chest pain, abdominal pain, arthralgias, myalgias, because of this AA amyloid just wreaking havoc and causing inflammation wherever it likes to deposit. And you can also get uh, AA amyloid inhibiting granulocyte function, so um, definitely you can increase your chances of things like infection as well. Okay, so that's amyloid in a quick sum up. Um, really, amyloid can cause many problems. It can cause stroke and cause vascular problems in the elderly. Uh, it's even associated with prion disease, Alzheimer's, you know. There's a lot of things we could talk about, but I think we've covered a, a good amount of the high yield points on amyloid, okay? Um, another one I really see often on tests is Tourette's, and it's not more so identifying Tourette's because you need at least one, uh, one verbal tick and multiple motor ticks, right? Um, to I have Tourette's, you need either, you need one of each verbal and motor at least, but the treatment for Tourette's is very commonly tested. And it's easy to mess it up because, I don't know, I've never seen, personally, I've never seen a Tourette's patient. And uh, the chances that I will aren't very high, so they know that. So how do you treat Tourette's is the real question, right? So alpha, alpha agonists, alpha agonists like guanfacine, clonidine, these are the alpha 2 agonists. Um, these guys are first line, definitely first line therapy for... Uh, Tourette's and the second line are the antipsychotics. So that's going to be um, things like your uh, risperidone. Risperidone is a very common one. You can also use dopamine block depleters like tetrabenazine um, to block dopamine. So uh, I think favorites are going to be either guanfacine or clonidine for the alpha 2 and risperidone for the uh, antipsychotics. The old antipsychotics can be used like haloperidol and flufenazine, but uh, those are falling out of favor because they're increased risk for side effects like tardive dyskinesia. So just remember the alpha 2s and the second generation antipsychotics like risperidone. Those are going to be the main uh, Tourette's uh, treatment options. All right, so um, another thing that's uh, great for, for test fodder is something like restless leg syndrome, where you have, you know, uh, usually it's going to be a female in her 30s or 40s, which has this feeling of she, she can't stop moving her leg at night, right? And the pathophysiology for this is kind of unclear. Um, it can be definitely associated with iron deficiencies and pr uh, watch out definitely for iron uh, in these patients. Definitely do some iron studies. You can also do a polysomnogram. Um, how do you treat it though? This the treatment here isn't to block dopamine, it's to boost dopamine like in Tourette's. Tourette's we're blocking dopamine with our antagonists, our antipsychotics. Uh, and here we're boosting it with things like pramipexol, ropinerol. These are dopamine agonists which are used in restless leg. Uh, you can also use uh, pregabalin and gabapentin, which we were talking about before with um, our anti-seizure drugs, right? So pregabalin and gabapentin also have their uses in restless leg, as well as, if you remember from what we were talking about before, herpetic neuralgia and neuropathies. So definitely remember uh, pramipexol, ropinerol, pregabalin, gabapentin, dopamine agonists for restless leg, and you're going to do your antipsychotics for Tourette's. All right, so I think that's where we'll wrap up today. Uh, it's a little bit of a shorter one, but um, we're going to try to keep this on a consistent schedule and hopefully cover more material in the next one. All right, I'll see you guys in the next video.